it is probably technically called the Bion Sauvant Law, but I can't really say that. So I call it the Bion Sauvant Law. You can call it whatever you would like. Um, the important thing to realize about this law is that this is actually an experimentally determined law. Uh, the, these two gentlemen went through and did a whole bunch of different experiments and basically showed that experimentally this works. So it looks like this. dB, in other words, little magnetic field, is equal to mu naught divided by 4 pi times I times ds cross R divided by R squared. Yes, clearly. Uh, mu naught is equal to, it's another, um, it's an, no, I, I'll get there. I'm going to go through it all again. Don't you worry. Uh, so mu naught is equal to 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7 teslas times meters per amp. This is current called the permeability of free space. So, generally what we see is this in the form of taking the integral of both sides. I'm going to go through it. I'm doing, doing it right now. Is that J or Going through it. Okay. We take, we take the integral of both sides. We get mu naught times the current divided by 4 pi times the integral of ds cross unit vector r divided by r squared. Note, unit vector r, r squared, ds, so many fun things in this. Now, the first year I taught this, it was not on the equation sheet and you had to memorize it. Please find it on your equation sheet now. They added it to your equation sheet, but it's not quite this. It's not exactly this, and I need you to understand where the differences lie. Say again? Uh, well, I mean, oh, that's, that's not the R cubed. It says R cubed, but it is the same equation. Say again? DL, DS, DX, doesn't really matter, DR. Yes, they have R cubed, I have R squared, yet I'm arguing it's the same equation. Loki. <laughs> R R is a unit vector. R R is a unit vector. I agree. <laughs> it is not a unit vector on your equation sheet. So instead of having a unit vector, they have vector R, which would then, if you were to work it out, it's going to be R cubed on the bottom instead of what we have here. They are the same equation. This is what I usually use. What we're going to go through now. What we're going to go through and do after. We take it one minute decompression session because this will take a while. Is we're going to go through and figure out the magnetic field that exists at a point x distance or a distance or something like that from an infinitely long current carrying wire. Get excited, and ladies and gentlemen. People enjoy your one minute decompression session. As advertised, what we are doing is we are using Biot-Savart's law to figure out the magnetic field that exists at a point some distance from an infinitely long current carrying wire. So we have a current carrying wire right here. We have a point which I'm going to label point P right up here. That point P is located a distance A from the wire. Note, I'll just do this because it's always fun. We have positive infinity and negative infinity, which of course is two times infinity, which is still infinity. Um, we have our point ds. So we'll take start right here. This is the direction of ds, because that's the direction of the current carrying wire, and we were to start right here. r would be, unit vector r would look like this, and is going to point to point p. So this would be theta initial. We're going to end it somewhere over here with ds this way. r would then be this way, unit vector r, and this would be theta final, theta initial, theta final. This is a, got everything. Oh, and this is going to be x distance away from there. Shut up.
That's helpful. It's on one minute ago. Mm -hmm. So, to review. DS, which is a little piece right here, is just a small portion of the direction we're talking about for the current. We have R, unit vector R is going to point from where DS is to our point P, and we have our initial angle is the angle between DS and unit vector R. Um, our goal here is the first thing we need to talk about is the direction. So if we just talk about a current carrying wire, any current carrying wire, it's going to look like this. And on one side of the current carrying wire, we're going to have the magnetic field one way. On the other side, it's actually going to be the other direction. The way we can see that is this. We have little ds, just taking a small portion of that wire. And we have r, unit vector r. Unit vector r points to the point where we're talking about the magnetic field. So we have in this, the magnetic field, we have ds cross r. So this is the cross product. That's the right-hand rule. DS, you point your fingers in the direction of DS. You curl your fingers in the direction of R, and your thumb is going to point in the direction of the magnetic field, which would be out of the page at point P on this side of the wire. If we were to do, use point P prime, which is on the other side of the wire, we go from DS, we curl our fingers in the direction of R, and our thumb is going to point into the page. In other words, at this point on the that side of the wire, the magnetic field is going to be into the page. When we look at it here, we have DS, cross R, at this particular point above this wire, that magnetic field is going to be out of the page. So we have now derived the direction of our magnetic field. We know that the magnetic field R is going to be in the positive K direction or out of the core. Out of core. So now, we need to go through and derive this, this equation. We're going to start out by just looking at this piece, which is ds cross unit vector r. When we look at this, we know, we already know the direction. It's in the k direction. Notice, no matter where we pick along here, ds cross r is always going to be in the positive k direction. So this is going to be equal to d x times r times the sine of theta times unit vector k, as we know the direction. Now, what I've done, I've re replaced ds with dx because everything's in the x direction. Unlike here, where the direction is changing constantly, here, for our current carrying infinitely long wire, ds is all in the x direction. This is the unit vector. Now, the unit vector just has a value of 1, so we can replace that with simply 1. So this is all going to be equal to dx times 1 times the sine of theta times k, or simply dx sine theta k. Now, I am going to drop the k because the k is just going to stay throughout the whole thing, and we'll put it on at the end because it's just everything's in the same direction. Um, so there's no, we're going to have plenty of stuff to keep track of. So here we go. Our issue is when we come back to this equation, the magnetic field is equal to mu naught times i divided by 4 pi times the integral of, we now have dx times the sine of theta divided by r squared. Because we showed that ds cross r is equal to dx times sine theta times k. Now, the issue we have here is we have an integral with respect to x, and we have theta, and we have r. We need to come up with a relationship between all of these different pieces of that are underneath the interval. The way we're going to do that is by looking at, for example, sine of theta is equal to, I should probably not use that. Sine theta is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. Opposite, this angle is A. The hypotenuse is R. So we have a relationship. R is equal to A divided by the sine of theta, or if you prefer, A times the cosecant of theta. One over sine is just cosecant. We can also, so we have a relationship here. That's not supposed to be an A, it's an R. We now have a relationship between R, A, and theta. So R and theta, it's just A is just a constant, it's a, the distance from the wire. We can also look at tangent theta. The reason we're going to look at tangent theta, which is adjacent over hypotenuse, is because it's going to give us a relationship between what's on the adjacent, which is um, 
I'm sorry. I have to say it clearly. Sol, ta, ha. I lost it. Opposite is the little a and the adjacent. Now, it's x, but notice it's actually to the left, so it's a negative x. It's to the left. So we now have, again, a relationship where x is equal to negative a divided by the tangent theta. Now, <coughs> bless you, 1 over tangent theta is actually the cotangent theta, so we have negative a cotangent times theta. Now, we can take the derivative of this whole thing. So dx is equal to negative times a. What is the derivative of cotangent theta with respect to theta? Negative cosecant squared. So negative cosecant squared theta times d theta. So dx is equal to uh, a times a cosecant squared theta d theta. So notice, coming back to our equation, we now have something for dx and we have something for r that we can substitute. So we come back to the magnetic field. Magnetic field is equal to mu naught i divided by 4 pi times the integral. Replacing dx with a cosecant squared theta d theta, we still have the sine of theta, and we can divide this by uh, r squared, and r was a times the cosecant of theta, but we're taking the square of that whole thing. So the magnetic field is equal to mu naught i divided by 4 pi times the integral of, well, let's see, uh, we'll do it in two steps, a cosecant squared theta times the sine of theta d theta divided by a squared times the cosecant squared theta. And a whole bunch of stuff cancels out. Uh, cosecant squared, cosecant, uh, cosecant squared theta and one of our a's mu naught times i divided by 4 pi, integral of sine theta d theta all over a. The good news, of course, is that a is a constant, so we can bring that up from underneath the integral. So b is equal to mu naught times i divided by 4 pi times a times the integral of sine theta d theta. So notice, that's actually something we can take the integral of, right? Our initial and final conditions are going to go from theta initial to theta final. Theta initial to theta final. Class, the integral of sine theta. <laughs> negative cosine theta. Mu naught over 4 pi a times negative cosine theta going from our initial angle to our final angle. So we have b is equal to mu naught i over 4 pi times the inner, or times going from final to initial is going to be negative cosine theta final minus a negative cosine theta initial. So b is equal to mu naught i over 4 pi going from cosine theta initial minus cosine theta final. Notice, we could actually solve this for something that was not an infinitely long wire. Uh, you just have to have, figure out what your initial theta was and your final theta. We have, in this particular case, yes, ma'am? Should the A still be used? Thank you. We lost an A somewhere in the middle of it. Wait, from there to there. Thank you. So our initial angle is going to be, uh, what is our initial angle then? And our final angle? So we have u naught i over 4 pi a times the cosine of 0 minus the cosine of 180 degrees. Again, mu naught i over 4 pi a. Cosine of 0 is 1 minus the cosine of 180 degrees, which is negative 1. Gives us b is equal to mu naught i over 4 pi a times 2, or mu naught i over 2 pi. So, the magnetic field that exists at a distance from a, in, an infinitely long current carrying wire is equal to mu naught i over 2 pi a, and we figured out in this particular case, at this particular location, that it would be in the k direction. The bad news is that you are responsible for being able to derive the 
uh, magnetic field that exists a distance A from an infinitely long current carrying wire. The good news is, is that this is not the way you're going to do it. This is something that you need to understand. This is not something you need to be able to repeat. Okay? So we've done this so that we can go through and derive Ampere's law. And I'll show you Ampere's law in a minute. Um, but we used the biot savart law, again, to prove that the magnetic field around a current carrying wire is equal to mu naught i over 2 pi a. 